open your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts. And we are in chapter 22. And we'll start at verse 1. set up the story a little bit because we're going to be jumping from when you listened to last week Mark. He was talking about the previous chapter and uh, some things have gone down since then and uh, it's actually very similar to the last time I spoke so you see a lot of repeated themes. It's not exactly the same but there's also a riot happening um, just right as we're getting into our text for today. And Paul is also responsible for the riot that's going down. And it has to do with his return home. So a good way to maybe look at this is if you read the Gospels, uh, Jesus, uh, one of the things he says as he preaches his first sermon is uh, a prophet is never welcomed in his hometown. And this is what's happening for Paul as well. He is... uh, returned to Jerusalem. So he's gone off to all of the whole world and preached the good news of the gospel. And he has all these Gentile converts, all these new converts, people from um, around all of Europe. And now, after all of that, we're getting to the end of the story. If you're watching Breaking Bad, then you know what happens at the ends of stories. Um, <laughs> if you're watching that show or any TV show, usually death is um, on the horizon. And it's actually not so different in the book of Acts here. As we're looking at Paul, as he's returning home, we're getting to a bit the end, the end of uh, what Paul's life looks like. And, um, as we get a picture here, we start to understand why, maybe if we really think critically, why would there be a riot happening? Well, Paul used to have a different life with these guys that um, were in Jerusalem, this Antioch Council. Okay, he used to be in charge of it. So in the early parts of the book of Acts, if you were with us during that time, if you've read it before, you saw that Paul makes his first appearance, and his very first appearance is... Um, at Stephen, when he gets stoned and his persecution, uh, Paul is the one sort of presiding over it, and he gets killed and murdered, and Paul kind of watches it all happen and approves of it. And so um, this is the kind of Paul that this group of people he's returning to know him as. And when they, he returns, they sort of gotten the inklings of what he's been doing and how he's changed. And so they have a lot of questions about who this new Paul guy is, and not even just questions, but outright frustration and anger, and so it all escalates, and they grab Paul, and they start to beat him, and um, they throw him in jail, and Paul is a Roman citizen, and so um, they are doing stuff that's sort of testing the waters as far as where they're at, because they're really mad at him, but Paul has a unique citizenship. And so Paul has the ability to plead with the prisoners, and he's basically saying, let me make my case to the, um, the people. Some of them know who he is, some of them don't. Sort of like the riot we talked about before. There's people that are motivating this riot that have anger towards Paul, but it's escalated. So a lot of people are, wa- are watching and they don't really know who he is and stuff. And so he wants to plead his case. And that's where we're going to pick up the story today um, in, in chapter 22. And th- this is what he says. You probably know this story. Brothers and fathers, now listen to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Those are, that's Paul's audience. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Silica but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. 
as the high priests and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring those people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My compassion saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me, my companion, saw the light, sorry. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all the people what you have seen and heard. And now, are, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. And so um, we see that, that Paul's life is a uh, nearing the end and it's coming because he is finally facing up to these people that he was forced to leave and I don't know about you but um, sometimes I think people's testimonies can be intimidating and also people's testimony I think Paul that's what Paul's doing here is he's he's sort of giving his fundamental story about why he has done what he's done why he's changed so much but I can imagine if I was one of these guys in the crowd, if I was one of these followers of Paul before Saul, before he was Paul, and I saw him go around killing people and presiding over the killing of people that he now says that he follows, I would imagine that if I was in that crowd, I too would be a bit skeptical. And these, um, these people are... Um, God's people, they're following God's law. They're listening to it. But they also have these political anxieties, and so they've become very zealous. They're oppressed people. I mean, it, it, it might be kind of hard for us to imagine, but um, when your livelihood is threatened by an overriding superpower, um, it's, we see this all the time in the world, that um, religion and politics, and, uh, politics and power sort of get intermixed and intermingled that was true for Paul's followers, and that's why they were turning to killing. They were zealous for their religion. And so that zealotry had blinded them, and, um, and Paul was, was, uh, was needing to be blinded in order to have this experience, this dramatic experience that would change him. God calls him into this amazing, incredible journey along the way, but I kind of want to focus on what is it about these guys? What is it about what they're holding on to that they can't see it? Because I, I think it, it, it's all around us. People, the, there's the head, the, you know, God is so incredible and big. But as Peter was praying, like, sometimes it's a surprise. And sometimes we don't see it. We don't, we can't understand it. And, and this blindness that they have is something that I think we all experience in our lives. And so 
we kind of need to learn from Paul what it means to be able to see, but we also need to be able to name our blindness. And we also need to, to um, be aware, become aware of the places that um, sin lives in our lives, and sometimes that's hard. That takes a lot of introspection. I know for me, like, it, it doesn't become immediately apparent to me all the time what I need to get better at. I sometimes assume that I am doing just fine. Like I'm working in the mess I can. And the things that I'm bad at, the things that um, I really mess up on, like I'm kind of comfortable with those things. And so I'm like, I kind of just give myself a pass for those things. And I, I don't think that um, the light allows for a pass. The light is searching in the darkness and it's looking to shine on all those places. And so that's kind of why we do these sort of more liturgical, introspective things. I think that's a really important thing about traditional church is it invites you to look back, to remember, to think about your life, to search yourself, your inward being, and discover what's really going on inside. And it's so easy to um, never go there. You need those moments of pause to take a deep breath to look inside. And so um, these guys are the opposite of that. They, they're taking no time to sort of look inside of themselves because their motivations are tied up in politics. And so they're blind. Um, and I, I would say this, they're listening to their lizard, okay? And um, this, this lizard is uh, from a story that we all know that went to the book club, okay? What? from the, the Weight of Glory, there's an amazing story in there. The Great Divorce. I mean, The Great Divorce, excuse me, I'm always getting those confused. I did read the book, most of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it talks about, um, it's a story that's basically, uh, it's a story about this journey, this dream journey that uh, C.S. Lewis is sort of going on. And it's a journey that goes, um, it's, it's, it's an ominous um, train, and it's going from hell sort of into heaven on a bus. Or train. And um, there's different people that, uh, different vignettes that you find in the story, and the story is trying to give us pictures of the things that prevent us as human beings from making it into heaven. The things that are the sins that people hold on to that prevent them from choosing heaven. So the idea is that heaven is locked from the inside. And so there's a lot of normal things that we all deal with and struggle with that prevent us from this hope, this beautiful sort of mountain that is depicted. And um, the, the people that are in heaven are known as the solid people. And then there's these ghosts people, the, the less solid people. And um, they're the people that are uh, trying to figure out how to make it into heaven. And most of the people in the story don't make it, but we're going to talk a little bit about the one that does, and we're going to read the story. So um, just to set it up, there is this guy, and it's very imaginative, so think of Narnia and all that good stuff, okay? There's a lot of creativity happening here. But uh, there's an angel in this guy, and uh, this lizard that he has that's speaking to him, and uh, the lizard is sort of dormant when you first meet, and the angel comes up to this guy who's trying to figure out how to get to heaven. He's sort of given up, so he tried to get there, and he's like, yeah, it's okay. I'm just going to go back, go back. I can't deal with this. You know, it's not a big deal. And the angel comes to him, and, he, and she says, I want to take that, that lizard from you. Will you let me take that lizard from you? And the guy kind of says, no, that's okay. I, I don't really want to have you, I don't want to, it's not a big deal, I don't want to mess with that. And the angel again persists and says, um, let me take that from you. And he, and he kind of says, if that's such a big deal to you, if it's such a big deal to you, then why don't you just kill it when I'm not paying attention? Like, why don't you do that? And the angel sort of says, I, I need you to give me this, this lizard. And uh, he, he also says, like, this lizard, it's not a big deal. It's sleeping right now. Like, it's not a threat to me. It's just sleeping on my shoulder. No big deal. Okay? But the angel persists and persists and persists. And finally, in a moment of courage, this man, he decides that he's going to hand over, in his terror, this lizard to the angel. And 
the angel does away with it. And then we're going to pick up with a story if you want to read it in your little notes. This is the quote that's there. And I got a little bit more than you do, so you'll have to catch up. This is what happens. Okay. So for a moment, I could make out nothing distinctly. Then I saw between me and the nearest bush, unmistakably solid but growing every moment solider, the upper arm and the, so and the shoulder of a man. Then brighter still and stronger the legs and hands, the neck and golden head materialized while I watched. And if my attention had not wavered, I should have seen the actual completing of a man, an immense man, naked, not much smaller than the angel. What distracted me was the fact that at the same moment, something seemed to be happening to the lizard. At first, I thought the operation had failed. So far from dying, the creature was still struggling and even growing bigger as it struggled. And it grew and it changed. Its hinder parts grew rounder. The tail still flickering became a, a, t a tail of hair that flickered between huge and glossy, glossy buttocks. Suddenly, I started back, rubbing my eyes. What stood before me was the great stallion I have ever seen. Silvery white, but with mane and a tail of gold. It was smooth and shining, rippled with swells of flesh and muscle. Whiny and stamping with its hooves. At each stamp, the land shook and the trees dindled. The new made man turned and clapped the new horse's neck. It, it's, it, it's no, it nosed his bright body. Horse and master breathed each into its other's nostrils. The man turned from it, flung himself at the feet of the burning one, and embraced them. When he rose, I thought his face shone with tears, but it may have been only the liquid love and brightness. One cannot distinguish them in that country, which flowed from him. I had not long to think about it. In joyous haste, the young man leaped from the horse's back. Turning in his seat, he waved a farewell, then nudged the stallion with his heels. They were off before I well knew what was happening. There was rioting, if you like. I came out as quickly as I could from among the bushes to follow them with my eyes, but already they were only like a shooting star far off the green plain, and soon among the foothills of the mountains. Then still like a star, I, like a star, I saw them winding up, scaling what seemed impossible steeps, and quicker every moment till near the dim brow of the landscape so high that I must strain my neck to see them. They vanished, bright themselves, into the rose brightness of the everlasting morning. And I love that picture because it's such a depiction of when we hand over our sin to God, the immense beauty and goodness that he can do with that space that we open up, that, that transformation from the sin of the lizard that can so dominate our head space and trans completely, utterly transform that into a brilliant stallion. That, that when, like Paul, was able to hand over such a massive sin in his life and look and search for the light and make such a massive transformation, this sin goes from this small, non-committal, ugly thing, you know, to this bright, brilliant, beautiful, radiant person. Um, I don't know if you've encountered these type of people. I see it all the time in people that they've decided to surrender certain aspects of their character <coughs> that they, they know is sinful. And they give it over for the sake of this immeasurably more that God is teaching us about and showing us in the life of Paul. This immeasurably more is why Paul gives his testimony to this crowd because he's finally discovered the courage to speak to the people he was running away from. Um, there are a few verses. One is, if you would like to turn to Ephesians 3.20, that Paul wrote. And uh, Paul wrote these 
to churches to teach them. And I think there's no possible way that if he didn't have the story that he had, that he would have been able to give us these types of truths. And um, this is one of my favorite scriptures, and I've been really trying to reflect and meditate on this one a lot. It says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is, at, that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I'm so convicted by this verse because I feel like I put God in a little small box. And what Paul's saying here is that God can do immeasurably more than we can ask or even dream. That that we think somehow this, this box is good enough, we settle for the box, when what God wants to do is so much greater. And it starts with offering over our lizard. And that's such a hard thing. I think it's so difficult to give our sin, to search our sin, and to be actually willing to hand it over to the God of the universe and say, give me something great, give me a horse. To, to believe in that type of a God, to believe in the type of God that wants to take every inch of our sin and make it something that we can't even imagine how good it is. That is a brilliant, brilliant promise. And you might ask, I think one of the things we have to ask in this story is, how is that true for Paul? Like, how is it immeasurably more? This guy keeps getting beaten. He keeps getting thrown into jail. Like, his life does not look so great at the moment. He was, you know, standing in front of, trying to save his life with his testimony. Um, but I'm glad you asked. Okay, because I think that uh, Romans 14, 8, 14 through 17 is an is a answer to that question. And this is what it says. It says, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, I love that picture that we get to inherit what is God's. That he, we are his children and he wants to give us everything that he has. But it doesn't look the way that we would expect it to look in any way. It's a transforming of expectations and what goodness is in our lives. Because that inheritance includes his sufferings. That what, what Paul has inherited from Jesus, and we see it especially now at the end of his life, is the book of Acts tracks along with the, with the author, tracks along with the life of Christ. And so you see in the life of Paul reflections of the life of Christ. No more true than in this scene where he's getting beaten, and it's a trial. And it's nearing the end of his missionary journey. And so part of his inheritance is suffering, along with the glory. And that's a part that I don't think we love as well. When we see that we give up, it's terrifying to give up our sin. I mean, that is so, so true, I know, in my life, that I am awfully afraid to stand up for the things of God, to let God see all the spaces, even though he already does, to allow other people to see my weakness, to name my weakness in front of my peers, and let them share my burdens. And that, this, is, this is what it means to share in God's suffering. And then also included in that is such a deep beauty. And that's where we go into a measure of belief. When we can name it, and hand it over, and then let God do the work of His glory. And let that, let that be enjoyable, that His glory would be something we would know and understand. Um, an example from my life, I think, that I, I've seen in the last couple of 
couple of years was, uh, so I didn't always want to be Mr. Pastor Man. <laughs> and uh, I was going to be a lawyer since my dad was. And uh, I was just going to do like mission work for a long time and not worry about being coming a pastor guy. Um, but then I was at this camp and I was praying and I felt like God was saying that you need to be the speaker. And so I went in and I asked if I could do that and I said, yeah, you can, you can try it out. And so I did that and, you know, I kind of went, okay. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, How do I want to do this? And uh, I spent my whole life with uh, some high schoolers and doing hanging out and then I'd get to talk about the Bible and I fell in love with that. And I was like, man, God, are you calling me to this? And I think, yeah, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it is. And uh, so maybe I'll go to seminary. And uh, that's where I think I got really tested because uh, it's in order to become an official pastor at, uh, in like a Presbyterian church, you have to do lots of hard work. And one of the things you have to do is you have to learn to read. And so they stuck me immediately into a Greek class my first um, year of seminary when I right got there at the beginning. Well, I'm dyslexic and um, I've always really struggled with languages my whole life and math has been difficult and different stuff, but I made it through Halloween. But uh, um, in this Greek class, I would spend hours, countless hours because I felt so called. I wanted to be a pastor so badly and I thought this is the only way that I can do this and so I spend hours and hours and hours and hours. And I just remember going up to my teacher like a few months in and I was like, I'm not gonna pass. Like, help me do anything. And he just looked back at me and he was like, oh yeah, everyone feels like they have a hard time at the beginning of grief, like, don't worry about it. And I was like, no, you don't understand. I am failing. Like, I know I don't understand one thing you are talking about, okay? And so I just kept going because what else are my options? And so I make it all the way to, uh, I make it to the final test. And then at the final test, afterwards, we have a meeting with the teacher. And we have a conversation about how the test went. And I remember just the anxiety of walking in there, kind of knowing that you failed, but lying to yourself like, I didn't fail. <laughs> you know? And uh, I walk in and I just see this paper and like it was just uh, like my stomach dropped. And I was just like, oh no, like I told you I said this. And so I walked in and he awkwardly told me how horrible I did. <laughs> and uh, how I probably need to try again or figure my life out uh, at the opposite of that. And I remember um, just just crying on the crier, so I lost it. I lost it in the, like that teacher must have felt so awkward because I was just losing it and like he didn't know all of those things and um, it felt like such utter, utter failure and like like a question like, God, if you called me to do this, why? Why this kind of failure? Why this kind of um, just absolute slap in the face? Everyone else is passing, you know? And I feel like I can do this. I remember I drove home. I drove to my parents' house and like just like got big hugs and cry. And I said, I don't know, I don't know if God's telling me to do this. Maybe I should think about doing something else. And uh, in moments of wisdom, and uh, as good parents can do, they just sort of affirm you and they say, Don't make that decision now. You know, think about it and then, then move on. And so I just kept going. I just and I kept, kept going in classes and I didn't do Greek and I changed from a major that needed to do Greek into a, a major that you could just kind of avoid languages and stuff. And that meant that I wasn't going to become like an official pastor. But that was okay to me because I, and I think that um, people ask you all the time, you know, how are you called to do this? And that's such a confusing question, you know, like, are you called to do something like we don't get like a voice from God all the time you know, that just gives us such clarity about exactly what decision to make. But I think one of the ways is that I, I suffered. Like, I really, really got tested 
And it was like, I had to transcend the suffering. And in that, I've never questioned after that moment that I was supposed to be a pastor. I just never had any second guessing. And I think that that kind of suffering, if you can give it to God over time, will show in you what if it was God's calling or not in your life. You can't know until you try it. And sometimes the failure will teach you things that you could never have learned if you just had smooth, easy sailing in your life. And so sometimes you have to step into the suffering of life. And what's amazing is, um, I don't know, you guys, some of you know more a history of this church than others, but uh, this church is actually joining a new denomination, and they changed the rules. And so um, I don't have to do Greek in order to, I can just use the degree that I have in order to get ordained in the new denomination. <coughs> and um, that I get to, I don't have to take tests that don't have Greek on them. And after I do that, so in the next month or so, you can pray for me. You know, it's just like monopolizing me time. But, <laughs> but I'm taking a big test, uh, and it's it's uh, it's one that I think I could pass. So um, in the next month, I may be able to become like an official pastor from sanctioned by the church. And I think that too was a sign to me that sort of God had a plan. You know what I mean? And I had no idea what that plan was. And so it just took a lot of steps in faith and, and failure in order to figure out what God wanted for me all along. And so I'm one of those people that learn the hard way. I don't know if you guys are. But I think the beauty at the end of these, these scriptures is that God wants you to measure like when you look back on your life, when you look forward, it seems so terrifying. And you, when you look back, I think a lot of times you say, God, you did immeasurably more than I thought in me at that time. You were really working on this aspect of my life. I'm so thankful for that, how you were teaching and guiding and prodding me. And so I think God um, is doing that in each one of your lives. And so I pray that this would be an encouragement to you to hand over the lizard, whatever that is, and let God do big things in your life in order to inherit all that is His glory and mix in with the suffering that comes with that. So will you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you for everybody here, and um, I pray that you would just give them your Holy Spirit to bless them, God. Not to bless them with easiness or with... Um, things that feed the ego, but with true love for you, and with true love for this life and this journey that we're on, God bless them and keep them, and may your, may, may your face shine upon them, now and forevermore.
clarify present. And you lay out the path, path before us for the future. We thank you that you're here now, always was, and always will be. That you sit outside of our perspective. And when something seems so immovable, when there's a mountain standing in front of us, and we've been told this is how it's done, and if you can't do it this way, then you're out of the game, Father. We thank you that you're able to move those mountains. You're able to change the rules. honor our faithfulness. He doesn't guarantee safety, he doesn't guarantee an easy road ahead, Father. You make a path. And you call us to make a path. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your love. Help us not to take it for granted. In Jesus' name.